welcome back. New year, same country. You may remember Hilda Matheson from her brief appearance in Vita's episode, but what about her life before and after the writerly Don Juan? Born June 7, 1880 in South London, our protagonist was the eldest child of a Presbyterian minister, and her younger brother would arrive eight years later. We don't know a lot about her early life. We do know that she went to a private girls' school, played hockey, and appeared in amateur plays. Then a trip to mainland Europe in 1906 cut that life short, forcing her to graduate a year early. The entire family went to France and Switzerland for two years for her father's health before they moved to Oxford in 1908. Though the experience interrupted her previous life, it enabled her to learn Italian, French, and German. So a cultured young woman, if anything else. Cultured, and we'll see it comes into play much later. Foreshadowing. <laughs> the return to England in 1908 saw her join University and the Society of Home Students in Oxford. Though when I say university, it isn't what you're thinking. The society wasn't part of any university, but it operated similarly. She was not the best student. Her tutors complained that she lived too full a life with hockey, becoming the team captain, singing in a choir, and still performing in amateur theatrics. Wow, so she just lives too rounded a life to be one of those nerds. What a shame. Now, do we know anything about those amateur theatrics? Sometimes they were Christmas and holiday-themed things, and they would appear in pubs. Ooh. Wow, so she's, like, not not just among her friends, but actually, like, performing for the public. Yeah, but I imagine she's not getting paid to do so, and that the acting is probably not the best. I imagine it was fun, though. And now, Vita is not the first woman to catch Hilda's eye. During this time, there's references to someone called the Vamp, and who Hilda said she'd do anything for. D do we know who this is? No, we just know she's called the Vamp. Wow. Oddly enough, she encouraged the men who fell in love with the Vamp, who later married twice because her first husband died of suicide within a year of the wedding. Oof. So I feel like there's a lot of hidden drama there, but like a lot of things, especially in the more off-the-beaten-path women of this podcast with their lives, we don't necessarily hear much and she's not like some of her contemporaries who were like really laying everything out there in their writings, um, except for the names. It sounds like she was maybe a bit more cagey. Uh, you say that, but as we will see later on, when it came to secretness, she and Vita would actually end up at odds. Ooh. But back to the vamp. Hilda's mother hated her, and this just made Hilda hang around her more. So, Of course, classic rebellion. <laughs> Yeah. All of this distracted her from her studying to the point where she could have been top of the class, but wasn't. This is despite there being a lot of all-nighters as well. Oof. After graduating, Hilda got a job at the Home University Library before becoming an assistant at the Ashmolean Museum, an archaeology museum. This was quickly derailed by the outbreak of World War I. In 1915, she became the secretary to the Voluntary Aid Detachment at the 3rd General Hospital. This was followed by a job as a clerk at the War Office before being recruited to the Special Intelligence Directorate in August 1916. Ooh. Now, from here on, we can only get glimpses of what she was doing for the rest of the war. We know she joined MI5 and worked in London, then Rome. There is some evidence that she worked on a project tracking and cataloging German spies. Using that library knowledge, cataloging. She managed at least one group of researchers, according to people who worked there at the time, but Hilda herself doesn't really mention her intelligence work. Oh, naturally not. I mean, she's got to keep it all top secret, doesn't she? At one point, she was offered a posting in Constantinople, but she refused because, as she put it, she didn't want to be a policeman all her life. Huh, so I wonder if maybe she was also keeping quiet because she just didn't like talking about it. Perchance. Meanwhile, the vamp clung tightly to Hilda throughout the war. But by 1918, she found other people to lean on, 
and sailed out of our protagonist's life. You see, Hilda was very self-sacrificing, always putting the other person first, looking for ways to please, and playing both mother, lover, and nurse. Poor Hilda, she's done so much for the vamp, and the vamp sailed out of her life, just left. Hilda then left the intelligence service in July 1919, when she was recruited by Lady Astor to be her political secretary, a job that she initially turned down. Ooh, I was beneath her, or? No, I think she just didn't much want to be in politics. And for reference, by the way, Astor was the first woman to sit as a member of the UK Parliament. We don't know how they met, possibly through Hilda's intelligence work, but the work was certainly more enjoyable than what some other women ended up doing after the war was over. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it was a very, like, active job that might have demanded more of her intelligence than a lot of other women. Yeah, to the point she actually stayed with Lady Astor until 1926, when she was offered a job at the newly created BBC. Ooh. She was uncertain about this change, believing that working for Astor had spoiled her for any other job due to the rapport and lack of strict supervision she'd enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, if I had that kind of job, I'd like it too. She estimated that she'd be fired after a month. She was not. She was instead made director of talks and out-earned even men in senior civil positions. Ooh, doing well for herself. I guess it makes sense since it sounds like she's really had a lot of opportunity to get good experience and flex her skills. When she arrived at the BBC... Everything was quite amateurish, as is anything when it first starts. Programming started at 10 with a religious service and only lasted seven hours of the day. A far cry from today's 24-7 radio. I'll say. It was also a tumultuous time. During the general strike of 1926, news spread out over the radio waves, and Matheson capitalized on this. In early 1927, she persuaded several newspapers to change the reporting time for radio news from 7 p.m. to 6.30 p.m., a change that broke the newspaper's stranglehold on evening news reporting. Over the next three years, news programs increased from 4% of the catalog to 9%, more than doubling and enabling more people to hear the news. From there, she branched the BBC away from its dependency on Reuters, and succeeded in doing so by 1930. Wow, so it sounds like she's really pushing them toward where they have gotten to now. I mean, obviously there's a lot of other stuff going on with the BBC, but in terms of focusing on news, that's really cool. Alas, there were also tensions with colleagues, especially with the directors of other areas. The balance between program areas like music, talks, news, education, and entertainment were fought over in meetings. I can imagine with, like, every director of of every area owning their particular area, everyone's like, oh, mine is definitely the best and most important. So I I could see where there would be some tensions there, especially since they don't have a roadmap. This is them just starting out for the first time. And this tension would increase later between her and John Wraith, who had hired her. But that was later. For now, they got on well enough that she had informal meetings sitting on the floor of her office with her dog and a gas fire. Wow. Unconventional and rule-breaking, but no one cared too much at this point. With everyone else in the office, she came off as standoffish. She wasn't a people person and worked better with small groups. In fact, the younger employees found her intimidating. I mean, fair enough. If you're standoffish, I think that's what ends up happening. Except for when you get to know her, judging by her writing. Yeah, well, I mean, you'd said earlier that in relationships she tended to be very giving and generous, so interesting how the perception was so different from the reality. But now we have more tension coming down the pike surrounding the ban on controversy. At that time, the BBC banned programming about controversial subjects, like debates on unemployment. Interesting. See, that's something that really makes it seem like this is a different BBC than the one we have now. Very correct, and Matheson didn't agree with this ban. She wanted subjects like the League of Nations, economics, and mind-boggling philosophical debates. 
opposed to like the news? She wanted news on the news program? Yes, how horrifying. She wanted news on the news program. So how did this go over? Well, not everyone appreciated this attitude and it took several years to achieve. By 1928, newspapers were also starting to complain about the ban, and this gave her leverage as she constantly wrote to the government to complain. Yeah, understandably. I mean, I can see where you could give a lot of news that didn't involve controversies, but you would miss some huge chunks. This resulted in the March 1928 removal of the ban, but the BBC would continue to ban reporters from expressing views on public policy. I mean, that's fair enough. I know that that's always a struggle with reporters, like, to to try to remain unbiased, but also sometimes things seem pretty self-evident. But anyway, this did not stop Hilda from diving into political broadcasting. In fact, she struggled with getting members of Parliament onto the air, as she'd write to Vita Sackville West. And speaking of Vita, her first broadcast at the BBC was in April of 1928. Visits between the two started that July, and the affair took off in December, much to Virginia Woolf's displeasure. So wait, so did they did they meet through this writing, or when did they meet? They met in 1928 due to the BBC broadcasting, so part of the talks that Hilda was promoting also involved culture, and Vita, as we discussed in her episode at the time, was a very popular writer. Add to the fact her husband was a diplomat and he would also later give talks at the BBC. So would Virginia Woolf, which was rather complicated. I love this. The affair was then interrupted when Vita left to join her husband at the embassy in Berlin. Thus followed a deluge of letters, sometimes three a day. Hilda scribbled them out during what others might have thought were the most inopportune times. Like in front of reporters at a League of Nations lecture. Really? She's been working so hard to push for this, and here she is, <laughs> writing to her crush. Yeah, but then again, she got a thrill out of it as she wrote, By Jove, what a shock all these good people would have if they could see what thoughts and longings are filling my head. Ooh, steamy. This thrill extended to the use of official BBC stationery and writing on the sides that explicitly stated, do not use this side. <laughs> Kinky. Vita would eventually give Hilda the nickname Stoker, mostly because the Stoker is, well, quite literally for one, it's a person stoking boilers in an engine room. But also it had to do with being the humble, hardworking Clever, but also, as Hilda's biographer put it, the nickname picks up so many aspects of her character. Her submissiveness offset by a jaunty independence, her busyness and practicality, her delight in making things work, and the relentless, single-minded, selfless way in which she applied herself to tasks and punished herself in the service of others. Oh. Now, of course, as we've seen... Vita did not limit herself to one lover and Harold at a time, if she could help it. Hilda apparently was fine with this. As she wrote, Of course I understand about Harold and the way you must feel about him. I should never expect you to feel otherwise. He seems to be so entirely the right sort of person for you to be married to. That's so sweet. In fact, Hilda would meet Harold who held her in high regard and actually asked her for advice when he considered becoming a journalist after leaving diplomacy. Wow, I love that. Being, like, chill with your partner-in-law. The same could not be said for Virginia Woolf, as mentioned earlier. But again, Hilda didn't mind. She would write, Oh, my dearest, I am so glad your Virginia thinks me all right. I should have minded if she hadn't liked me at all. Okay. New title for this episode, Hilda Didn't Mind. She is just putting up with things. She is. Of course, despite what she wrote to Vita about Virginia, Virginia did in fact mind, but as someone on the internet actually commented about this book, the only biography, at least that I know of, about Hilda, there is a great deal of BBC drama, 
but not nearly enough Virginia Hilda Vita and whoever Vita was frolicking down a lane with drama. Mm -hmm. But back to the episode, because then, of course, speaking of whoever Vita is frolicking down a lane with, there was also Dorothy Wellesley. And again, Hilda didn't mind. I feel like this is a children's book, maybe even a counting book. Vita has one husband. Vita has one husband and one girlfriend. Vita has one husband, one girlfriend, and one paramour. And Hilda didn't mind. But yes, Hilda didn't mind because, as she wrote, I feel also that Dottie stands for something that has been and is still important to you, though not easy to fit into your present life, and that this makes another problem. Darling, I suppose the truth is life can't be simple for a person who has many sides and many gifts like you, which attract very forcibly so many people. You know how sometimes people's like whole personality is that they're polyamorous? I have not come across this, no. Well, <laughs> according to Hilda, you have, and her name is Vita Sackville West. So basically, yes, while Virginia and Dorothy were not amused at this arrangement, and even Vita got anxious over it, Hilda would instead go on to write, If you were to tell me you had murdered your grandmother, deceived your husband, beaten your children, embezzled from your bank, or broken every commandment in the Decalogue, I might regret it, I might even deplore it, but I should love you just as much and perhaps more. It's something much further inside you that I love, your actual flame. Hilda? That's the sweetest thing, oh my god. <laughs> I'm gonna get tooth decay from all of this. So yeah, as it turns out, different personalities have different reactions to all this. Virginia's was jealousy, and Hilda's was still putting other people first. Now, this did not mean that she didn't snap at Vita sometimes when she teased the journalist about other women falling in love with Vita. Hence the line, No, I do not want you to have an affair with a red-headed photographer who makes you feel like you must disinfect yourself after you've seen her. <laughs> what does that even mean? You shouldn't have an affair with People who you feel like you need to take a shower after seeing? Yeah, yeah, no, I got that. It just... <laughs> Interesting. Likewise, they were at odds over secrecy. Vita, aside from the Violet debacle, was discreet with her various affairs as this was the time of the sensational trial over the book The Well of Loneliness. Yeah, so this is a dangerous time. This is there. I feel like there had been some back and forth about whether women could even be into each other. And and now the well of loneliness has shown no, there 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 are women out there who love each other. I presume you're referring to the famous episode of Queen Victoria being presented with the possibility of. Lesbian sex and being like, how would you even do that? Yeah, I mean, everyone knows that sex is, is a man thing that men do to women. And if there's no man to do it to a woman, then, I mean, if a tree falls in a forest, you know? But moving on from that debate, basically Hilda disagreed. In fact, she resented any discretion and tended to tell the people close-ish to her. Kind of like how Virginia Woolf and her sister Vanessa talked about the affair with Vita in the checkout line of the pharmacy. <laughs> the image of that. Vita did not appreciate this. Yeah, no, I think it's it's like they're living in two different genres, and Vita is, is in kind of the spy thriller where everything must remain secret, and Virginia and Hilda are kind of living in the the coming out story where you have to be real and true and honest with the people that you love. Now, that all being said, Hilda was becoming a known figure for her work at the BBC, which meant more public scrutiny about her life. That troubled her, as Catherine Furse had been sidetracked because the powers that be have dubbed her homosexual because of her friendship with Rachel Crowdy, which may possibly be true, amongst other gossip she relayed to Vita. After all, it'd be quite the scandal for the BBC director of talks to be gay in the early 1930s. 
Right. So so she wants to be out to like her circle, but we're at the point where other people than her circle are interested in her life. The problems of celebrity. Not to mention she was at odds with her boss over the purpose and subject matter of the talks. There was a great deal of arguing with Wraith over which talks got approved. So her work life was constant meetings, rewrites of scripts, and battles to get things on the air. Do you have a particular example of things that she was trying to push out there that he didn't like? At one point, they were arguing over Harold Nicholson having a talk about modern trends in literature. Oh, how dare he? <laughs> well, you see, they was specifically going to be about Ulysses and Lady Chatterley's lover. I see. Controversial topics, shall we say. As 1929 progressed, she felt more squeezed. Papers usually sent to her were now being directed to her boss's assistant. As this atmosphere continued, Hilda decided to leave. She officially resigned at the start of December 1931. This came on the heels of tremendous work stress, the death of her beloved father, and the end of her affair with Vita, Oof. though the two remained friends. In addition, she had an overactive thyroid condition, Graves' disease. Wow, so it's just everything all at once. That being said, she didn't stop working. She couldn't anyway, as she had no true inheritance after the 1929 crash. Wow, all right, yeah, everything at once. But by 1933, she had a new project and a new lover. Ooh. The two in question were the African Survey and Dorothy Wellesley. Ooh, the very same from before. There is not much written on this relationship, but considering people touched on Dorothy's sleepwalking, exaggerating her own gift for poetry, and the occasional bemoaning of her life's progress, it can be assumed it wasn't an easy one. However, it was still affectionate and lasted the rest of Hilda's life. And as we have established, Hilda could put up with a lot, so <laughs> maybe they were perfectly suited. Yeah, I attribute a lot to Hilda's long-suffering devotion to whoever she's with for whatever reason. If it works for her. As for the African survey, it was a study of problems arising in sub-Saharan Africa due to the issues surrounding a lack of information to base imperial policy on. It's absolutely massive at 2,000 pages and covers cultural difference, governance methods from European powers founding colonies, economic outcomes, and a ton more. It was headed by one of Hilda's friends, and she herself wrote several chapters and was instrumental in getting the thing published in 1938. Wow. Sounds like quite the endeavor. Yeah, when I say instrumental, I mean at one point, while the actual director was ill, she stepped in as an unofficial director of the survey and was essentially directing everything from mid-1933 to mid-1935. So she was also, like, shaping how the entire report would look and, like, what information was needed, pulling together the whole mess of data just a ton of headache-inducing stuff. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, this work actually resulted in the reward of an extra year's salary, and she was given an Order of the British Empire Medal. Yeah. Now, this is important work. I mean, it's... We would love if they just kind of ended their colonizing right there and just stopped doing that. But since they weren't gonna, having at least better data for like how to be humane about it insofar as you can be humane about colonizing i will not comment about on government and humaneness after african survey fair enough anyway the end of the survey and the year 1938 saw lady astor congratulate hilda and offer her a job working for her again in politics Ooh. but mi6 got to her first Wow. <laughs> Sought after. After spending six weeks in the French Riviera with Dorothy Wellesley, 
She returned to London and started working on propaganda for the intelligence service amid rising international tensions. Once again, her work was out of the public eye as her Graves' disease escalated alongside the road to war. Here, she was now in charge of the JBC, a broadcasting service separate from the BBC and initially part of the Foreign Office. Oh, so kind of combining both types of work that she had been doing up until this point. Yes, but technically it was two sections. One broadcasting clandestine messages into hostile territory, and one publicly broadcasting announcements to friendly territory. For example, the German writer Thomas Mann made a broadcast to Germany, pointing out how the Nazi party had brought the nation to the brink of war in August 1939. Later, after war was declared, the organization would help make contact with just beginning resistance groups on mainland Europe. Wow, so this is important stuff. It is, but Hilda did not always have smooth sailing during this time. For one, her old BBC boss became head of the Ministry of Information in 1940 and tried to curb the JBC's independence. No. So there was that old battle revived. The fact she was friends with foreign nationals who helped make the broadcast to foreign nations at the JBC didn't help. Oh no, she knows those foreigners. Yeah, in wartime it just aroused suspicions amidst all the hysteria. Those English. The attempts to remove the JBC intensified under this. In the end, Hilda lost, and the organization was transferred to the BBC in 1941, but she wouldn't see it. Hmm. Her health had worsened, and on October 30th, 1940, she died aged 52 during an operation on her thyroid. She had been working in overdrive up until her death between running the JBC, being ill, and trying to get her staff out of internment. Her obituaries were a mix. One left out mention of some of her work. Another commented that she did her best work when between a rock and a whirlpool, which I think is an accurate description of most of her life. Just very energetic. It's believed that her ashes are interred at a gravestone on a farm called Pens in the Rocks, where she had lived with Dorothy. Wow. It just... You hear all this stuff about, you know, the major contributions she made in her life. And I'm just like, why have I never heard of this woman before? Isn't that the way it goes with a lot of people? I mean, how many people have heard the very interesting story of, say, Julie Dobini? Yeah, now you're right. Also, how many people have heard that British fascism was started by a woman after World War I? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot of really important players in history that for some reason get left out yeah not always with as good a intention as hilda here Mm -hmm. now is she in anyone's like books or poems or whatever does she get included in anyone else's works she is referenced in other people's biographies in terms of fiction there is a modern novel about someone going to work at the BBC in, like, 1930, and she is a background character as, like, this, the main character's boss in the talks department, and it talks about her working there and the affair with Vita coming up. Ooh, what's the novel called? Gotta have it for our listeners. We can't let them down if they want to, you know, get into this world. It is called Radio Girls. Ooh. have to add that to my reading list. Oh, I've read it. It's quite good. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn more, check out the website. You can follow us on Twitter if Twitter still exists. And remember, when your partner collects lovers like marbles, continue to believe Virginia Woolf thinks you're all right. <laughs>